comes to getting great guitar tones, there's one place that invariably is producing some of the best guitarists that have ever lived and that have ever been recorded, whether we're talking about country music or popular music. And the epicenter for these players is no other place than Nashville, Tennessee. And whether you're talking about session musicians like Tom Bukovac or Derek Wells or Kenny Greenberg or Brent Mason, or you're talking about country artists like Keith Urban or Brad Paisley, all of whom are amazing guitar players, there is a Nashville sound and there are certain pedals that are associated with a lot of these players that have become kind of the canonized group of pedals with which the majority of Nashville guitar players use. So today we're gonna explore some of those pedals and some applications that players have used them so that we can have a better understanding collectively of what is the Nashville sound and what those pedals do, whether it be distortion pedals, overdrive pedals, EQ pedals, or boosts, we're gonna investigate it all and we're gonna hear it in the context of not only hearing it isolated, but in a track to really see what these pedals do. So today for this exploration, we're actually gonna be using a song from Rascal Flatts, Life is a Highway. And although it's a cover, I think most of us associate it with Rascal Flatts just due to the popularity of, of the song and it was featured heavily in a Disney movie called Cars. The song is Life is a Highway. And we're gonna be taking some of the parts that were played originally by Joe Don Rooney and incorporate different pedals that are part of kind of that canonized Nashville sound. And although Joe Don Rooney likely didn't use all of these pedals, maybe he owns a few of them as part of his rig, I think that we can still demonstrate how viable these are in the context of the track, how well they work with a myriad of different guitars, and we're gonna be using lots of different guitars today from Strats to Tellys to Les Pauls to 335s. And so we can really get an idea not only of how these pedals sound in isolation, but how they work synergistically with a pretty developed and pretty busy mix in the case of Life is a Highway. So the sequence today is we're gonna go through the pedals, which I believe encapsulate the Nashville sound. We're gonna get to hear them by themselves and in the context of the track. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history and the context of the pedal. And for all of our demonstrations today, we're gonna be using just a clean Fender platform. We're gonna use a Hot Rod DeVille ML for all of the clips today. And we're gonna be using a Line 6 M9. And although we're going to use the M9 today, we're not gonna use it as part of our five canonized pedals that make up the Nashville sound, but I am gonna be using it for all of our delay and reverb tones. So any of that that you hear today are going to be called up through the M9. So just naming that, if you want to learn more about why the M9 is an important asset and why it's used by so many Nashville session players, we have a dedicated video that's just on the M9 on its own. All right, so the first pedal up is going to be the Nobles ODR1. And this is a amazing, transparent, and maybe bordering on mid-range overdrive. And this really came into popularity in the early 90s when Tom Bukovac went to a guitar shop in the Nashville area and had formerly been using a Tube Screamer. The owner of the store that he went to told him to compare the Nobles ODR-1 to his Tube Screamer. At the time, they were only about $30. And he absolutely fell in love, got rid of his Tube Screamers, and has evangelized the ODR-1 ever since. And it has consequently become the staple overdrive of almost every Nashville rig. And it's even gone as far to LA where a lot of session musicians in LA tend to favor this particular overdrive, whether it's guys like John Shanks or Tim Pierce, both big time users of the ODR-1. Now it has somewhat of a mid-range character to it, which is similar to what a Tube Screamer does, but it has a lot more low end response and certainly doesn't have the boxiness that you would ordinarily associate with a normal Tube Screamer. And I think that that's why so many Nashville players love it and why it's such a staple. So today I'm gonna to be using it with my Telecaster in the bridge position. I'm gonna be playing kind of a chunkier rhythm part that kind of leads into the chorus section of the song Life is a Highway. And I'm just gonna be using that first individually so you can hear kind of the core tone without any track involved. And then I'm gonna put it in the context of the track so you can hear it both ways. Again, we're gonna be using the Fender amp and I'm gonna be using the M9 for a little bit of delay and reverb in addition to the ODR1 pedal. So let's hear it on its own first. So 
So sounds great there. It has the distortion and kind of overdrive characteristic that you'd want, transparent, smooth, just a little bit of edge to it. But now let's see how it sounds in the context of a track and whether it can really fit well in the context of what's going on there with a more busy arrangement. So the ODR-1, absolute classic, sounds amazing, but as you can see, I've already pulled out another guitar and I've pulled out another pedal. I'm gonna be using the GE7 now as another example of a pedal that's an absolute Nashville sound classic. Now the GE7 is something that we've seen a lot of guys use as far back as session guys like Brent Mason in the 80s and 90s. But I think that companies like Exactone have taken what the GE7 does and just taken it a little bit further in terms of making it more specific to the guitar frequencies and modifying those pedals to be quieter and really work better for guitar players in a session scene. Now guys like Tom Bukovac use this, Derek Wells, Kenny Greenberg, and I think even Brent Mason still uses this GE7. And it's a great way to sort of carve out the guitar part that you need, pair it with an overdrive, and just give it something that it doesn't have on its own in terms of the EQ. And what I'm gonna do today in terms of the context of the Rascal Flat song is there's kind of like a little shucking part that kind of stays throughout the entire song, but really comes in really prominently in the intro section. And I believe it's a Les Paul with the bridge position and has the mid-range kind of carved out of it just to give it a little bit more chime and jangle on that top end. So what I'm gonna do is take the GE7, I'm gonna carve out the mid-range, boost the high end a little bit as well, and maybe lower the bass slightly and just use it as a way to kind of help me cut through because there's a lot more busy instrumentation going on in this track especially as it transitions from the intro section into kind of the beginning of the song I want to make sure that I'm cutting through and that pad kind of stays throughout the entire part of the song that layer just continues so you really want to make sure you got some nice chime and a little bit more cut through on that and so that it can really sit nicely in with the mix so I'm going to show you first the Les Paul with the GE7 and doesn't have any track involved we got a little delay and reverb from the M9 again going into the Fender amp, and then we'll transition to hearing it in the context of the track. So there it is with just the pedal. Now let's move it into the track and let's see if it maintains that clarity, that top end vibe to really kind of just help support everything else that's going on in the song. Now the GE7 again is an absolute staple and a wonderful way to really help carve out the tone and get either different sounds out of the overdrives that you didn't think were possible or to even change the fundamental sound of the guitar. I remember seeing a cool video of Tom Bukovac showing how he could take a 335 and make it sound more like a Gretsch just by way of how he manipulated the bands of the EQ. I'll link that video above and in the description below if you're curious about how he was doing that using the graphic equalizer. Now, as you can see, I've changed the guitar here and I've got an ES-335 and I'm gonna be using this in combination with another pedal, the Moss Distortion, the MT-10 by Ibanez. And this is definitely one of the most musical distortion pedals that you'll ever play. And I think it's a large reason why it's so popular here in Nashville. And again, has even permeated down to Los Angeles where guys like Tim Pierce use this pedal routinely on their pedal boards. Now, the thing that I think it does really well is it does distortion without having clipping that's a little bit too hard edge or a little too asymmetrical. It keeps everything still nice and warm and fat, has a lot of articulation and sounds very tube-like in fact when you're digging into it. And I'm gonna be using this to play the core part of the chorus in which really requires a good amount of distortion to have plenty of body and have plenty of tightness to go along with that. And I'm gonna leave it on the bridge pickup. I'm gonna set everything pretty much on the Moss Distortion at noon. And I'm just gonna just blast that into the front of the Fender amp, have a little delay and reverb again from the M9. And it really is gorgeous gorgeous at just sort of taking whatever goes into it, distorting it and not making it sound uncharacteristic of what it's supposed to be. I think this is a large reason why so many guys use this on their pedal board and it really has become a Nashville staple for kind of higher gain overdrive and distortion sounds. Let's check it out first just on its own and then we'll put it in the context of a track. <laughs> So 
So that sounded great. Really, again, musical, fat, lots of body, lots of beautiful harmonic content. Let's see if it maintains that same vibe as it goes into the full track, where it's certainly a much busier mix. <laughs> So Moss Dorshin, absolutely amazing. Love what it does. So musical, so beautiful. No matter what you put it into, they really do sound great, whether it's a clean amp, an amp on the edge of breakup. A really great distortion pedal, one of my favorites of all time. And I can certainly see why guys in Nashville love it. But as you can see, I've done a guitar change again. I've gone back to my Les Paul, and we're gonna be using the RC Booster, one of the most classic effects that have been used ubiquitously in Nashville since the original RC Booster came out in the early 2000s. Now guys like Brent Mason have been using this, guys like Tom Bukovac, Derek Wells, Kenny Greenberg, guys just use it to early on in the chain typically to kind of boost into other effects. In fact, I even noticed that Guthrie Trap is a guy that uses this. So even guys that kind of do more solo artist things or the stuff that he does with John Oates still is a very useful piece of equipment that's boosting into other overdrives to get them a little more saturated, add a little bit more output, and really just add some more gain to what's going on. So I'm gonna go back to a pedal that we used a little bit earlier, which was the Nobles ODR-1. I'm gonna put the RC booster going into it so that I can get a lead tone. And I'm gonna do some of the kind of intro lead tones that come in on Life is a Highway so you can hear what that does. Again, Les Paul in the bridge position, I'm going to kind of carry up to those notes. I'm going to kind of hold some longer sustaining notes. And it really just turns that overdrive into a much more sustained, much more thick and beefy lead tone than what the ODR-1 could produce on its own. And I really need to be able to get that feedback and that sustain from the pedal and the guitar paired with the amplifier. And I can't do it with just the overdrive alone, or if I turn up the overdrive too much, it doesn't maintain the same kind of compressive element that I need that stacking it with an RC booster will do. Plus I have the EQs available on the RC booster to add boost, to add gain, to add also treble and bass. So I can really adjust it based on what the pedal is that's following it to really make sure that not only does it fit with the EQ of that pedal, but also fits with the gain structure of that pedal. So I'm gonna be boosting those together, going RC booster into ODR1. Let's hear it first on its own, and then we'll put it into the context of the track. <laughs> So that sounded amazing. It was nice and fat, thick, plenty of sustain there, really had a nice compression to it as well, the way that it boosted together, just created a really nice sustaining compression that I could really just hold on to and that note could just carry out for me. Let's see how it does in the context of the track. So that sounded amazing. Absolutely a great boosted tone. You can see why so many guys love it because of its control when it's boosting other effects. You have those EQs on it for bass and treble. You can add a little bit more output with the volume control, add a little bit more grit with the gain control. It really is a versatile pedal. And I think as far as boosts that are coming early on in the chain, that's one of the best ones ever made and certainly is a good reason as to why that's a staple on most Nashville rigs. But now I've changed guitars again, and I'm gonna be going into the TR2. Now the TR2 was a boss pedal that came out 20 or 30 years ago, and it is one of the few analog tremolo pedals that's really still in existence. It doesn't have a lot of fancy features like tap tempo or any of those other things that some of its digital counterparts might have, but what it does, it does amazingly well. And even without any modifications, these sound actually pretty good straight out of the box. But if you send it to somebody like Exact Tone or Robert Keeley or Analog Man, they can fix some of the inherent problems with it, the primary of which is that it loses a little bit of output when you have the depth up really high. So typically these companies will add an output control so you can separate the amount of volume that's coming out of it relative to the depth and the speed that's set in the pedal. So I had mine modded by Exact Tone, and it's absolutely incredible. And I'm 
going to set it to the speed of the song and just a little bit of depth and enough rate to kind of match up. And I'm going to just use that in some of the in-between positions on the Strat and kind of just do some arpeggios and just kind of add a little bit of texture as the song transitions into the solo section. So let's hear how it sounds first on its own and then let's put it in the context of the track so we can hear it in both ways. So that was just on its own, guitar, tremolo, a little bit of processing from the M9 for delay and reverb in the, in the Fender amp. But now let's put it in the context of the actual song and let's hear how it does with the track. Again, those arpeggios, just adding a little bit more movement and kind of just creating a different feel as we transition into that solo section where Joe Don Rooney would then come in and play that beautiful solo that's a part of Life is a Highway. Let's check that out. Now that sounded absolutely great. I think that this tremolo is just so amazing, analog, incredibly musical, and is so simple. It doesn't have tap tempo or a lot of the things that some of the digital incarnations of tremolos have that maybe some of us have come to expect. But if you're just going on raw tone per square inch, I don't think anything beats the TR2. It's an amazingly well-built pedal. Sounds great with those exact tone mods. It absolutely ups the game tremendously. I highly recommend that you check out this pedal. Also guys like Analog Man and Robert Keeley have offered mods to these that have been used by many Nashville session greats. However, the exact tone seems to be the one that most of them have gravitated toward these days. All of them are great, of course, and I highly recommend that you check it out. Now, if you dug this video about the Nashville tone and the essential pedals within that, I highly recommend that you like, you subscribe, you leave me a comment and tell me about other pedals that you think might be on this list of sort of Nashville essential pedals and maybe even based on different generations. The generation now is, is kind of more almost rock oriented, whereas if you went back to maybe the early 90s or late 80s, you would get more of the Brent Mason types, really more of kind of classic country chicken pickers and the types of gear that they use was kind of fundamentally different than sort of the 80s rock kind of edge that a lot of the guitar stuff has now for modern country music and a lot of the stuff that you see coming out of Nashville. Also, if you want to check out any of these pedals, I'm going to list all the ones that we use today in the description so you can check that out. I'm also going to link my video on the M9, which is what we use today for all of our processing for delay and reverb separately from these pedals individually. And I'm going to list the isolated tracks that I used for this song. If you want to try to put something together yourself, play over it, you'll have the option to be able to do that. I'll list all the tracks here for guitar, vocals, and all that stuff. So if you want to check out what those sound like, what those are doing, I'll have them all linked in the description below as well. And if you want to support what we're doing further we have a bunch of ways that you can do that an easy free way is to head over to our podcast which is the chairman of the board podcast where i do weekly episodes with grant from goodwood and brian from omillion audio where we have a roundtable discussion about pedal boards gear and best practices it's a great way for you to have maybe a long form version of similar conversations that we have here every single week and if you want to support us further beyond that we also have paid services available on patreon and over on the rigdr.com as well as all the materials and supplies that we use to build every single board, whether that's zip ties, cables, tie down mounts, or you can head over to vertexeffects.com where we sell all of our pedals that many Nashville session musicians actually use, including our Vertex Boost. And you can check out all of our dealers over on our website. And until next time, I'm Mason Marangella from Vertex Effects, AKA The Rig Doctor. And that was our exploration of the Nashville standards and the Nashville sound and the pedals that'll help get you there.